The Olympic opening ceremony was short on Ozempic, but not on offense. But should Christians be offended at all? I say no, and I will discuss why. Plus, are you ready, America, for Kamala Luther King Jr.? Because she is here to save the republic. And they want to know, are you buying it? Welcome to your favorite night of the week, The Deep End on Tim Hatch Live. Yeah, welcome in, everybody. It is Tuesday night, and it is episode 33 of season 7 of The Deep End. And I am here to tell you that we are moving The Deep End to Monday nights starting next week. So tune in one day earlier going forward. It seems like all the news happens on the weekend. And we want to hit the ground running on Monday and get this delivered to you earlier. So 24 hours earlier, Monday nights, 7.30 p.m. here on Tim Hatch Live. And if you're here for the first time or maybe the third or fourth time, click the like button, the notification bell, and the subscribe button. Get notified also by clicking that notification bell every time we go live. Hey, everybody, This content is for educational purposes because I'm going to be sharing some Olympic footage that I'm sure they're going to be monitoring there on the YouTube algorithm and probably suppressing this content. So let's get into it because the Olympics gave us a ton to talk about. News. The news you choose if you could choose news. You know, you watch the Olympics because you want to see people do things that the human body doesn't normally do. Flip, twist. Dive, run, shoot, I don't know, all kinds of things like that. You don't usually tune in to the Olympics to see drag queens perform with children, but that's exactly what you got in Paris a couple of nights ago as the Olympics opened up. And the outcry was enormous. So enormous that if you go into the uh, Olympics YouTube page right now, you will see that their opening highlights are not available. And they'll probably suppress this content, like I said before. They really made a mess. They stepped in it. They offended, or at least looked like they were trying to offend, every Christian on the planet. The show, let's show some of the highlights, opened up with a bisexual threesome, at least suggestively, and then a bearded trans drag queen, or bearded drag queen, if you will, in blue tights, danced around with children on the left and on the right, uh, lining up across this along this bridge, celebrating with this person and we would just fast forward to what was perhaps the most offensive moment the queen bee of blasphemy if you will yes mrs i don't use ozempic herself next to a child surrounded by drag queens imitating leonardo da vinci's the last supper marie antoinette was uh, beheaded and singing at what looked like a replay of the french revolution and then of course we had papa smurf getting jiggy with it in front of the 12 drag queen disciples of the queen bee of blasphemy. That was the Olympic opening ceremony, and it was a picture of the fall of Western civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, we had a good run. Europe, you had a good run. I mean, Europe can trace its heritage to Acts chapter 19, when, when Paul the apostle brings the gospel into what is now modern day Greece for the first time in history. And it led to the establishment of the Roman church, the Eastern Orthodox church that led to the establishment of the medieval church and on and on it goes right through to the reformation. The doctrine of justification by faith comes back to the fore of the Christian movement through Martin Luther and the reformers in the 1500s, where right in the middle of Western Europe. And then you have the, uh, the John Knox Reformation, if you will. You have the Anglican movement starting in England. You have uh, the pilgrims, the Puritans, which lead to the Christianization of the Americas. I mean, Europe, you had a good run, but it looks like it's over. <laughs> and the Olympics are here to say as much. So I have to share a sensitive image because this is the epitome of the travesty. Now, Fair warning, okay? Maybe guard the little ones if if you don't want them to see this. This image here of one of those men next to Papa Smurf and the Ozempic Queen, it looks like some of his parts are hanging out of his pants. And he was right near a child during this moment in the performance. So the Olympic Committee is doing damage control for all of this mess. And this was their press release on what's really going on down there. You won't believe this. And this is why I shared the image. It's actually not his privates hanging out of his pants. 
their statement is, no, his pantyhose were ripped and they're exposing a part of his skin. So <laughs> we are living in a culture right now. This is quite the moment where the better option is to explain that the dude's pantyhose ripped open right near his junk rather than his jingle bean was sticking out. What a time to be alive, my friends. So who was behind this travesty? Who was behind this artistry, 21st century artistry? Well, that would be this person, queer artist Thomas Jolly. He directed the whole event, the Paris Olympic uh, commi- uh, opening ceremony committee. Jolly came up with the idea of recreating Jesus' Last Supper with drag queens, which featured, again, a near-naked blue smurf man and a drag queen exposing his testicle to a young child. The, art, the artistic director said he wanted everyone to feel represented. Now, this is also pretty alarming. Af- the after party for the opening ceremony went like this. And let me just show you who's featured here, just so you know. Remember the bearded drag queen who danced in the blue leotard? There he is. Look who's next to him, parting it up in the after ceremony. Children and more drag queens. Just having a blast. I mean, why always with the kids? Remember, these are grown men dressed as sexy women, and they're at a rave with children. Always going for the kids. We're coming for your children. They sang it in San Francisco. They mean it in Paris 2024. Now let's talk about the Last Supper because I just want to say a couple things historically and then something biblically. Okay, because that's why I'm here. I don't, you know the news. My contribution is from a biblical pastoral perspective, how do we approach this? Well, number one, this is certainly not what the Last Supper looked like. This is a uh, Renaissance rendition, okay? Leonardo da Vinci's painting is a Renaissance rendition of the Last Supper. The table was not straight. Uh, Jesus was not a white European man with long hair. The disciples were not effeminate 40 to 60-year-old men surrounding him. Uh, No, historically speaking, the table itself in Jesus' day would have been a triclinium. Triclinium, the word tri, three, and it meant three-sided, horseshoe-shaped piece of furniture. This is probably what it looked like. This is a Roman triclinium um, uh, artist representation where the table would be in the center. You would lounge around, like almost laying on your side, grab for the food in the middle of the table, and then you would eat. And by the way, Jesus wouldn't have been in the center or, if you would, the the um, bottom part of the U or N, depending on how you're looking at it, perspective. He would have been... Uh, from the left of the table, the second person in. That would have been the host's seat. And so there, there's that. That kind of softens the blow there for Christians. That It doesn't mean that they weren't still trying to represent what they believed was the Last Supper. And it, and it could very well offend many, many Christians, as it has in many, many places. The ironic thing was that God kind of had the last word because not just 24 hours after the opening ceremony, the city of Paris was blacked out and everything was dark except for the lights of a church, the Basilica of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, located at the summit of the Butte of Montmartre. And this is just amazing to see God himself getting involved. In fact, somebody posted this on the internet. There he is, Jesus. I don't like renditions of Jesus, but there he is, pulling the power plug on Paris after the opening ceremony. It reminds me of Psalm 2, where it says, the Lord looks from heaven on the raging of the nations and he laughs. He laughs. He just just kind of chuckles when people try to make fun of him. You guys have to remember, Christians, that our God is greater than all, and you can mock him, and you can spit in his face, and he's still God, and he's really not intimidated. He, I don't, I don't think he gets intimidated, friends, when we peasants of the universe specks on what is a bigger speck called Earth in a slightly larger speck called the solar system, which is on a slightly larger speck called the Milky Way galaxy to him when we get offended or when we get, when we, when we try to poke fun of him, he is God almighty. Now again, damage control from the Paris Olympic committee, the organizer, the organizers issued an apology to Christians for the last supper parody. And here's how that went. To, to show disrespect to uh, any uh, religious group. Uh, on the contrary, uh, I think that Majorly really tried to uh, 
really intend to, to celebrate community tolerance. That was uh, his word yesterday. And uh, looking at the result of the polls that we shared, uh, we believe that this ambition was, uh, was achieved. If people uh, have taken any offense, uh, we are, of course, really, really sorry. Um, that's kind of the mean girl's apology. Oh, we're so sorry you were offended at what we did, even though we achieved what we aimed to do, which was to not show disrespect to anybody. But if you got offended by it, we're sorry that you're offended. I mean, that is the that is the line that you say when you're not truly repentant or apologizing. <laughs> so basically, stick it, Christians. You were offended. We don't care. So that's that's the one track. Let's, let's fake apologize. And here's the other track that they're taking. The news media is pulling the old Jedi mind trick on the public, claiming that this wasn't the depiction of The Last Supper that you were seeing, which had total Star Wars Jedi Mind Tricks vibes going on for me. These aren't the droids you're looking for. These aren't the droids we're looking for. Just kind of funny to see the Olympic Committee um, trying to pull the Jedi Mind Trick over our eyes. It's just kind of funny. Now, there's more about the Olympics than the opening ceremony. For instance, the Washington Post actually doing some journaling journalisming journalisming recently and they decided to report on the fact that a convicted child rapist is at the olympics and he is competing okay this is a man from the ne netherlands who flew to england at the age of 19 to rape a 12 year old child and then had her take the morning after pill because she was a minor this is unbelievable that this man is allowed to compete in a worldwide telecast presentation of sporting events. Oh, but good news, he's being isolated from the others during the Olympics. So Paris, good job. You, you really got things tamped down. It's no coincidence that the Olympics event with the opening ceremony where drag queens are dancing with kids and somebody's genitals are hanging out next to the kid also has convicted child molesters, um, abusers, really, competing in the events. This, this is the fall of the West. Further proof that there is very t little tolerance for Christians at the Olympics. Um, they banned a gold medal favorite from using his surfboard that had an image of Christ the Redeemer statue from Brazil on his surfboard. So full on tolerance for every group of people except Christians. And I say every other group of people except Christians because they did allow this Palestinian comp uh, competitor to wear a shirt with airplanes dropping bombs representing the carnage that is supposedly happening to the people of Gaza um, from Israel. And then at the same time, no one was allowed to wear the yellow ribbon, which would have symbolized the hostages still being kept by Hamas in Gaza as we speak. So you can wear certain things at the Olympics that are political, so long as it's damaging to Jewish people and Christians, that's fine. But anybody else, no, <laughs> right? Um, that's, that's where we are as a culture. That's where we are, Western civilization. Not all of us, of course. Not you, not me, not 1.8 billion Christians. And then there was always the immediate reaction to the Christians even talking about it. Because what, what happened? What did you hear? Oh, oh, they mocked the Lord's Supper. Oh, Christians, you're always so angry. You're always so offended. Isn't that exactly how the, the, the narrative goes? Christians say anything and we're just crying persecution and being offended all the time. I, I would like to suggest something. First, I'd like to admonish Christians, be not offended. I don't think that you're all offended. And let me know in the comments if you were offended, because I don't think we need to be offended. And I would, I would caution you not to be offended for one simple reason. Jesus famously declared in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds, notice that word, all kinds, of evil against you falsely on my account. Then he says, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. There are two key words in that text. First is revival, re revile, which is not persecute. There's a difference between revile and persecute. The word revival here means to speak disparagingly of a person in a manner which is not justified to insult them. And then the word rejoice 
When you're insulted or when you're spoken against disparagingly, rejoice. And that Greek word is, the literally, is literally the Greek word for feeling happy. Jesus actually is saying, I want you to feel happy when the world insults you on my account. Was this a world purposely insulting? No, they claim that it is just, you know, representation and artistry. But we all know that deep down inside, drag queens are not fans of true biblical Christians. And queer men in Europe are not <laughs> fans of biblical Christians. They probably did this with some latent subconscious hostility or outright hostility. I don't care. Here's what Jesus said. Feel happy about that. Do you know why? They hate you because they ain't you. They know that you're right with God. They have every right to feel animosity. You are accepted in the beloved. You are a member of the family of the Most High God. You have eternity in heaven, in paradise, waiting for you. And if they hate you, it just shows that, that that's because you don't belong to them. And they don't belong to you. Now, of course, we Christians, we don't wish harm upon them. The, the Bible says in Ezekiel that, that God himself does not to take pleasure in the death of the wicked. So we don't sit there and hope for their demise. Not only if we're going to be honest, biblical Christians, we're going to weep in some cases for the lost nature of the world, for the abandonment of societal norms in the West because of the advancement of secular sexual progressivism that has that has truly become an elite and powerful establishment in France and almost here in America. We should, as Christians, absolutely not be offended. Talking about it does not make it being offended by it. We're talking about it. We're, we're not going to be blind, but we have to talk about it from the sense that, man, people are lost and Sin is real. It always grows. It always expands. I mean, it, it was just a couple of years ago where they would do these wonderful displays of pageantry in these countries at the opening ceremonies. And it doesn't take long, does it, for this grotesque, you know, development of societal rot. And we are having a bird's eye view on the Internet of this. Everyone can have their phone out and looking at it. Here's what I'm trying to tell you, Christians. Rejoice. The world hates you. Rejo feel happy. They hated Jeremiah. They hated Ezekiel. They hated Isaiah. They hated Elijah. They hated Elisha. When they needed those men, they came and asked them for help. And some of you, that's where you're going to be in life. People will hate you as a Christian. But when the rubber hits the road and the chips are down and they are, you know, at the end of their rope, they're going to come find you. So be careful here, Christians. My last admonition to you is be careful how you respond to open displays of hostility against you because you're going to have a moment at some point with someone to tell them about Jesus when everything in their life is falling apart. And finally, the kingdom of God is not predicated on the acceptance of our society or civilization. Elon Musk tweeted out, unless there is more bravery to stand up for what is right and fair, Christianity will perish. To which I responded, absolutely wrong. Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will never prevail. Christianity is not some state-sanctioned culture maker. It is the work of the unseen God through his spirit, alive in people from all nations, tongues, and tribes. Glory to God. We are not dependent on this world loving us to see God build us and expand his kingdom through us. Amen, somebody. Now, perhaps the, a twist of irony at the Olympics is that former megastar vocalist Celine Dion made a comeback appearance at the ceremony, which is kind of ironic for a reason that I'm about to tell you, because I have some news about her, courtesy of someone that I'm going to deem as Mrs. Deep End, my wife, Cheryl. My wife, Cheryl, forced me to watch this documentary that is presently on Prime Video. It was released on June 25th of this year. It's called I Am Celine Dion. 
And it is a very sad account of what has happened to this woman, this this global superstar with an angelic type voice who has sold hundreds of millions of records and lives in the lap of luxury and now struggles with something called stiff person syndrome. This is a neurological disorder that affects one in one to two million people. And I just want to show you some clips she of her now. Very good. This is who she was. This is who she is. I think I hit some stuff that was amazing. That's who she was. But there's been moments where... This is who she is. I had to go to the studio and I knew they wanted Celine Dion. And she goes on to say, I don't know who that is anymore. Very, very sad stuff, what has happened to her. And we don't rejoice in her demise. No, we pray for her because I think that there might be some demon possession here. If you watch the documentary, at the end, you will see her have an episode of stiff person syndrome and her face curls up and her fingers stiffen and she can't breathe and it's excruciating pain. And you say, wow. And my wife said, okay, watch the documentary, and then I want to show you something. And this is, so Mrs. Deep End, all credit to her. Then she showed me this commercial that Celine Dion put out um, about a year before she was diagnosed with stiff person syndrome. Watch this ad. We miss the past. They dream of tomorrow. We may thrust them forward into the future, but the course will always be theirs to choose. Uh, that ad, that ad goes on, and they try to come and arrest her. And so, if you're if you're listening, let me explain. She goes into a maternity ward, and she blows this uh, black uh, pixie dust, if you will, over these children with blue for boys and pink for girls. Um, you know, outfits on, and then they all become black and white outfits, and some of the outfits say "New Order" on them. Well, the ad was for a clothing line that she was launching for gender-neutral clothing for children. Yes, this is an article headline on this. Celine Dion explains why her next move is a kid's clothing line. And it says right here, co-founders Iris Alder and Tyle Mil- Mitchberg or Milchberg worked with the superstar to create a line that liberates children from the traditional roles of boy, girl, and enables younger people to grow on values of equality with the freedom to strengthen their own power of personality based on mutual respect. End quote. I mean, that's kind of a weird move from global vocal superstar to gender neutral clothing for children and the ad was released about a year before she was diagnosed with stiff person syndrome had to shut down her concert tour and can barely sing at all anymore and you have to wonder what happens when you mess with the kids what happens when you mess with the kids god has something to say about that jesus said if you mess with these kids It's best for a millstone to be hung around your neck and you be tossed into the sea. And some of you will say, that's offensive to me. I'm a big fan of Celine Dion. I'm not telling you not to be a fan. I'm just telling you, I see what I see and you need to see what you see. And you better watch out because there is a God. There is a true, holy, righteous God who has his eyes on children and angels assigned to them. And if you touch those kids, he's coming for you. I don't know. Perhaps her comeback at the Olympics was exact, exactly The irony the whole event needed to reveal the absolute abysmal moral compass now present in Europe and in this country. But for some people, the ceremony was overwhelmingly wonderful. And I'm speaking, of course, of Dr. Jill Biden, the sitting president of the United States. Here's what she had to say about the whole ceremony. It was spectacular. The rain did not dampen our spirits. And Casey, honestly, every step of the way, I was thinking to myself, oh my God, oh my God, how are we going to top this? How are we going to top this? So, okay, so Paris has the, you know, Eiffel Tower, but we have Hollywood, and, and, right, and the magic of Hollywood that makes all dreams come true. So I think we're going to be okay. 
Yeah, that's what some people think about those Olympic ceremonies. And you can make your judgment as to whether they are right or wrong. But I think you have my take on it. And that's that. I would like to say goodbye, Dr. Jill. I'm so glad that we won't have to deal with your speeches for much longer. Because guess what? The savior of the republic has been found. Now, moments ago, she was the least popular vice president in American history. But today, she is Kamala Luther King Jr. And that brings me to politics. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, um, Joe is toast. The switch has been flipped. And Kamala is now the nominee, nominee for the Democratic Party for the president of the United States. Not a single person voted for her in the primaries, okay? This is a woman who could not win even a single primary in 2020. She didn't even make it to Iowa in her first bid at president. And now she is going to save the republic from white supremacy. That's at least what the media wants you to believe. So the switch has been flipped, not just um, Joe for Kamala, Kamala Luther King Jr., but the switch has been flipped for what the media previously thought of Kamala to what they think of her now. And I've got this video. I've got to show you this. This is what the media blitz, a media blitz, an indoctrination campaign, if you will, friends. Don't be, don't be fooled by this of how quickly the media is now aiming to switch it on for Kamala, a person that even they themselves formerly thought was a big mistake to be vice president of the United States. Watch. There are reports that say that you have the lowest approval rating of any vice president. Well, there are polls that also say I have great approval ratings. <laughs> Pretty big drag. I think she was arguably Biden's worst political decision. They don't like her. There's lots of reasons they don't like her. Kamala Harris's approval rating is now at 28%, which is uh, an historic low for any modern vice president. We're hearing it from main, mainstream media. Uh, one outlet after another. One leak after another. Uh, that Kamala Harris is the worst vice president ever, the worst politician ever. We don't see the vice president. What, what people are saying to me, and I'm sure they're saying it to you, where is the vice president? Some White House officials are feeling that, that she came off looking unprepared for inevitable questions about when she might visit the southern border. He picked Kamala Harris to be his running mate. She was ranked and is ranked as the most liberal senator in the United States Senate. So he could have gone the other way, but he went, he went to the left. Joe Biden is running for re-election, and I will be his ticket mate. Full stop. Full stop. Sit. Two weeks later. I'm, I'm jumping out of my seat over here watching this. I think people have been thirsting for this. And I'll just say this, you know, and I, I'm with Tim. I'm Tim, I'm jumping out of my seat higher than you, my, my brother. I'm just going to say that. There was a twinkle in her eye. There was a kick in her step that, you know, when you're vice president, you know, I don't, you're not loose. You can't, you know, there's somebody above you. There's somebody you don't want to overshadow them. You want, and this was quite the coming out. And I got chills when she said, Donald Trump, I know you're tight. I was blown away. I was like, I kind of fell in love with her. I, I thought she was smart, engaging. She's funny, feisty, twinkle in your eye, punch you in the gut. I mean, everything you kind of want. And I just thought it was a great, great opening act. She looked completely comfortable tonight with, uh, the, with the words she was speaking. They felt organic. Uh, and, and genuine. Are you stupid or something? I'm as stupid as a stupid does. That's the question the media is asking you right now. Are you stupid or something? Because if you believe that this woman is suddenly the savior of the republic after what they said about her just before she became, became the nominee, I got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. I mean, yes, this is quite the switch show change, Joe. Now she is compared to people like Martin Luther King Jr. And on Tucker Carlson, a former Republican candidate named Ben Carson said, said it better than I can put it. We're about to take a big test as a society. Here's what he said. Absolutely. She can win. This is, this is going to be a great test of the power of the media to take someone who formerly was universally disliked and transformed them into a godlike figure. And they will use everything that they have to try to do that. The question is, are the American people smart enough to see through it? And I actually think the American people are smarter than anybody gives them credit for. 
Um, yeah, I hope you're right, Dr. Ben Carson. Really, really do, because the campaign blitz is in full swing. So I just want to show you some highlights, and then we're going to talk about her policy positions. And I only do this to share the information that you're probably not going to hear on the mainstream news, because they have to re-present her, not just present her, but represent her and represent her as some kind of Obama-like savior. It's unbelievable to see it happen in real time. We are watching a simulation. So here's her first ad. Plenty of pl progress flags. The freedom not just to get by, but get ahead. The freedom to be safe from gun violence. The freedom to make decisions about your own Abortion. Body. We choose a future where no child lives in poverty, where we can all afford health care where no one is above the law. Trump's a criminal. We believe in the promise of America and we're ready to fight for it. Because when we fight, we win. So join us. Go to KamalaHarris.com and let's get to work. I'ma keep running cause a winner don't quit on themselves. So Beyonce music, pride flags, abortion, put Trump in jail. That's the um, campaign. That's what they're going to tell you she's all about. Now, last week, she took to a record store to talk about the historically black jazz albums that she purchased. This is a woman who was Indian American three weeks ago. Really one of the greatest jazz performers ever. One of my favorite albums of all time. Roy Ayers, Everybody Loves Sunshine. You know this one? So good. It's a classic. And then Porn Game Best, right? And this is a beautiful one. It's Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong. Okay, so um, <laughs> I heard I heard from someone that I'm I'm close to that black families historically have all three of those records all the time because they're very important to the black culture, the jazz culture, and. It's just kind of ironic that the media is being subservient to Kamala suddenly being black by going to the store and buying the records that she probably should have had already. I don't know um, <laughs> how much more I could take of what we are watching go down in our culture. But that's that's the media's job. They have got to represent the Democrats well. They've got to um, shield us from all of the policies that are horrendous, which I'm about to share with you, and they've got to demonize the Republican candidate no matter who they are. Remember, Republicans, Hitler, Democrats, savior. That's the media narrative. That's what you'll see on ABC, NBC, even some portions of Fox News, CNN, MSNBC. And this is going to be the test that we face over the next, I don't know, 96 days until the election. Will we buy it? Well, Christians, I've got the policy uh, positions of one Kamala Harris here for you. First, let's talk about marriage and sexuality. In 2010, Harris refused to defend a constitutional amendment that was passed by California, California voters, which restricted marriage to a man and a woman. Because she refused to defend it in her role as attorney general, it was left to the supporters to mount a legal defense. In February 2013, Harris argued in an amicus brief opposing the bill that the legislation was unconstitutional, that the supporters should not be allowed to defend it in court. The Supreme Court ruled in a 5-4 decision that the defenders of the bill did not have the legal standing to defend it in a federal court. The bill was later overturned, and there, therefore you have gay marriage in uh, California. She has also been a vocal supporter of the Extreme Equality Act. This would be a federal law that would go into place and add sexual orientation and gender identity to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which has been viewed as the most serious threat to religious liberty ever considered in college, it uh, in Congress. It would undermine women's sports completely as anyone identifying as a woman could, complete, could compete as a woman in... Uh, female sports under Title IX provisions. That's her view of marriage and sexuality. And by the way, when she kicked off her official campaign for president, she, of course, sat down with a very large and strong voting block. That would be drag queens with RuPaul. Watch. Hi, everyone. It's Kamala Harris. Each day, we are seeing our rights and freedoms under attack, including the right of everyone to be who they are, love who they love, openly and with pride. So as we fight back against these attacks, let's all remember, no one is alone. We are all in this together, and your vote is your power. So please make sure your voice is heard this November and register to vote at vote.gov. Can I get an amen? Amen! Now on with the show.
And remember. Yeah, uh, that's that's the religion of the LGBT squad. They even say, can I get an amen? My word, they have truly hijacked Western civilization. Now, just so you know, when it comes to RuPaul and the drag race, a harmless, uh, family-friendly television show that you should watch. Okay, this is footage of a RuPaul drag event where kids are encouraged, as you will see here, a young boy dancing across the uh, stage with drag queens behind him and then collecting dollar bills as if he's a stripper at a strip club. This is a RuPaul Drag Race event. Now, look, if sexualizing the kids is your thing, then RuPaul is your guy, and he's all in for Kamala Luther King Jr. But you, Christians, don't be fooled. Oh, and then, of course, we have to talk about illegal immigration, according to Kamala Harris. Here she is on The View saying that she will decriminalize border crossings. Favor of saying that we're not going to treat people who are undocumented across the border as criminals. That's correct. That is correct. So we're not going to treat people who commit crimes as criminals. And there's more to that with Kamala. We will talk about in just a moment. By the way, we have crossed an inflection point in America where more people are coming into our country from across the border illegally than being born here as Americans. As this chart shows, American children are no longer the primary source of new residents within the country. More arrived in the past year than the number of kids born to mothers in America. Now that might be something you wanna celebrate, but the thing that you have to understand is that when you come into this country illegally and you break the law to get here, you already present the idea that you don't care about the laws of this country. So what laws will you respect? And then there's the idea that she was the border czar. And then, of course, the media now has to twist it and say she was not. But I want to show you the receipts here from her own tweet. POTUS asked me to lead our diplomatic work with Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras to address the situation at the southern border. All the news media said she was the border czar. She was here, there to stop the migration on the southern border. Even here is the resolution from the House naming Kamala Harris the border czar. And you say, well, okay, fine, she was the border czar. Oh, no, 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 not because it's such a disgraceful thing that's going on at the border. The media has to cover for her, represent her, and tell you, um, these are not the droids that you were looking for. Watch this <laughs> epic takedown video of how the media is gaslighting you on whether or not she was the border czar. Watch quote unquote, border czar. Vice President Harris was not a border czar. Meantime, Vice President and border czar Kamala Harris facing some backlash. What he said about Harris and immigration was not true. She was never appointed border czar. Uh, and this will be her first visit to the uh, U.S.-Mexico border region since she was appointed as the border czar by President Biden. People gonna have to counter the misinformation. You already hear folks talking about the border czar. She wasn't the border czar. President Biden tapped Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris, to be the border czar. Now, she wasn't the border czar. That's what Republicans uh, labeled her. They were very critical of Kamala Harris, especially in her role as border czar. Now what she's up against is folks lying about her border record, calling her a border czar. Kamala Harris, who was appointed as the border czar. The Biden team didn't declare her the border czar. They wanted her to work on kind of the root causes of mm -hmm. immigration. There has been so much criticism against Kamala Harris. You know, she was the, the border czar. Calling her sort of the border czar, uh, which wasn't necessarily the case. So the border, if they weren't planning to address it in a major way, do not make her your border czar. Are. She met with some of the Northern Triangle countries, but nothing has effectively changed. Yeah, that's the media narrative. The gaslighting is at peak efficiency right now. It's an amazing thing to watch unfold before our eyes. George Orwell famously said, the party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. We have the receipts. We can see it clearly. She was the border czar. Now she's not the border czar because the border is such a mess. We don't want to give her the credit for the mess that it is. Now, when it comes to the climate, Kamala has a simple solution. Don't have kids. Here she is being interviewed on the climate issues, and that's her suggestion. Watch. I've heard young leaders talk with me about a, a term they've coined called climate anxiety, right? Which is fear of, of, of the future and the unknown of whether it makes sense for you to even think about having children, whether it makes And she goes on to make that as if it's somebody else's suggestion, but we have another proof on the contrary. Well, here's one that's pretty alarming for a lot of Christians, her views of the Second Amendment. And she seems to be very favorable to the confiscation of not just assault weapons, but very perhaps all of your weapons. And on an Enmus NBC interview, she said the following concerning a mandatory gun buyback program. Watch. What would you do about the 
millions of specifically assault weapons right. that are already in circulation. What do you do about those? Well, there are approximately five million to your point, Craig. We have to have a buyback program and I support a mandatory buyback program. It's got to be smart. We got to do it the right way. Um, but there are five million at least, some estimate as many as 10 million. And we're going to have to have smart public policy that's about taking those off the streets, but doing it in the right way. Doing it in the right way, mandatory buyback program. They make it sound like it's so wonderful. Oh, the government will give me money, and they have to. No, you have to give the government your guns, and then they'll give you some amount of money that they deem necessary for whatever guns that you have. This is a confiscation of your property. This is a um, this is tearing up the Constitution and eliminating civil rights that we have long held on to. And that was her view. She's kind of a weather vane. She just goes with whatever question it is and just says, yep, I agree. Uh, here she is at a 2019 debate. You know it's pretty bad when Joe Biden has to call you out to remind you of the Constitution. Watch this. They said, I'm going to issue an executive order, Biden saying there's no constitutional authority to issue that executive order when they say I'm going to eliminate assault weapons, saying you can't do it by executive order any more than Trump can do things when he says he can do it by executive order. Does the vice president have a point there? Some things you can. Many things you can't. Let's let the senator answer. Well, I mean, I would just say, hey, Joe, instead of saying no, we can't, let's say yes, we can. <laughs> let's, let's be constitutional. I mean, it's bad when Joe Biden has to tell you, uh, remember the Constitution. This is unbelievable that she is being represented as some kind of Obama-esque constitutional authority when she is clearly not. Then there was an amicus brief that she was signed on to supporting a total ban of guns in the city of Washington, D.C., and that is pretty alarming. Literally no guns in Washington, D.C. She signed on to the amicus brief saying, yes, I support us forcing people to relinquish their firearms in a city in America. But she isn't against all gun ownership or all violent offenders. No, actually, she was very much in favor of the pro-BLM marchers from the Summer of Love 2020. She actually called on people from her Twitter account, a tweet that is still up, saying, chip in now to the Minnesota Freedom Fund to help post bail for those protesting on the ground in Minnesota. And of course, one of those people that was bailed out, uh, $35 million came in for the MMF or M MFF, the Freedom Fund there. $35 million came in. It was promoted by celebrities and Harris herself, and it bailed out people accused of sexual assault, including a man who allegedly sexually assaulted his 16-year-old niece. The fund also helped bail out six men accused of domestic violence between June and August of 2021. And so, again, Kamala is not totally against violence. It's just certain violence, you know, like the mostly peaceful protests that we saw in the summer of 2020. She's okay with that. She's just not okay with you uh, law-abiding gun owners having possession of your own firearms. Now let's talk about abortion, a very, very important um, key political policy debate amongst Christians. Actually, there should be no debate for Christians. We are pro-life. But she became historically the first vice president to ever visit an abortion clinic in 2024. She toured a Planned Parenthood clinic in Minnesota, praising the clinic workers for providing, quote, true leadership and helping people access the, quote, health care that they need. And then there's this. She targeted Catholics specifically. And she has a long history of this, both as the Attorney General of California and as Senator and now Vice President. There is this montage of her uh, targeting Catholics online. I want to show you a portion of it. In 2016, as Attorney General of California, she authored the search of the home of pro-life activist David Delayden for undercover videos exposing Planned Parenthood officials discussing alleged sale of baby body parts, but did not investigate the practices the video showed. Some Catholics say it indicates Kamala Harris lacks tolerance for those who practice their faith. Senator Harris has previously stated she doesn't necessarily think Catholics are eligible for federal service, and yet she is potentially going to serve as vice president under the second Catholic president were Joe Biden to be elected. So I really Now, critics say because Joe Biden has flip-flopped so many times over the years that uh, Joe Biden is here, especially with preserving of life, where Harris is actually here in, in a strong pro-abortion stance, and they are concerned that she could have a major influence on the Biden ticket. Tracy? Um, yeah, she is 
she, in hearings for judicial nominees, she questioned certain Catholics being members of the Knights of Columbus and considered them unfit for public service based on that membership. The Knights of Columbus is the largest fraternal order of men in this country. And because they're Catholics, Kamala Harris believes that they are unfit to serve on federal benches? Really? Th this is targeting a specific group in our country, a large voting bloc, American Catholics, who traditionally vote Democrat. <laughs> it's kind of unbelievable. Now, on abortion, she is 100% a cheerleader. LifeNews.com reporting that she would support abortions up to birth in all 50 states. Famously, she supports, she supports the Women's Health Protection Act. It would oppose no limits, um, on de uh, no limits abortion on demand at any point in the pregnancy for all 50 states. It makes the abortionist whose payment depends on whether the abortion can be performed the sole decider of what viability means. Yeah, that's not nefarious. <laughs> she, it also says any state is welcome to widen the circumstances when post-viability abortions are allowed. It would remove informed consent protections for parents. It would supersede not only all state laws, but also all current and future federal laws, including the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which would allow for doctors with religious exemptions to not participate in performing abortions. This is Kamala Harris, as she really is. Uh, Fox News reporting that she called the House passed Born Alive Act extreme. This act actually would protect a baby born after surviving an abortion. So, no, rather put the survivor to death from the abortion. That's Kamala Harris. She called it a danger to women's rights. She is extreme as it gets on the abortion issue, on the gun ownership issue. And if that's your thing, if you're down with drag queens and no guns and killing babies, she's your presidential candidate. Just know what you're voting for. And then one time she let the secret part be heard out loud. Here she is talking about how to deal with climate change. Listen to the perhaps Freudian slip she makes here. When, when we, we invest, invest in, in clean energy, energy and, and electric, electric vehicles, vehicles and, and reduce population, population more, more of our, our children can breathe clean air and... Reduce what? <laughs> reduce population. Now, of course, she meant to say pollution and the White House transcript edited it out and put the right word in there. But you have to think that comes from somewhere. Now, this week alone, we have seen all kinds of more representations of Kamala Harris as white girls have come out in support of her and white dudes have come out in support of her and black girls, you know, identity politics at its peak. So this was another alarming moment in the abortion, the pro-abortion view. Pete Buttigieg, who is a homosexual man married, quote unquote married, to another man who adopted twin children, and on a Zoom call with white dudes for Harris, he said the following. Watch, see if you can hear what he's saying here. I'm so glad she has made freedom the theme of her campaign because I think in so many ways that's what's at stake. And yes, women's freedom is exhibit A after Donald Trump demolished the right to choose. But of course, men are also more free in a country where we have a president who stands up for things like access to abortion care. Men are more free. Men are more free when women have abortions. That's basically what he said. And this is from a homosexual dude who has no chance of impregnating a woman. But think about the underlayment, the underlayment truth that they're letting out of the bag there. They're, not truth, but their, their belief. We need abortion for men to be free from responsibility. And this USA Today uh, survey shows that the number one reason why women have abortion is because they don't want their lives to change. Less than 1% is because of incest, and 1% or so is because of rape. The vast majority of baby killing in this country happens because women just don't want to upend their life for a child. And this is one of her key issues. This is what they're going to say she is a champion on. Now, how about your property? She wants to take your guns. She wants you to hang out with drag queens. But she doesn't want you to have... A meritocracy. A meritocracy. She wants everything to end up equal. She is full-on socialist communist. Now listen to how she talks about equity and equality here in this clip. It has to be about a goal of saying everybody should end up in the same place. And since we didn't start in the same place, some folks might need more. Equitable distribution. 
giving resources based on equity, understanding that we, we fight for equality, but we also need to fight for equity, understanding not everyone starts out at the same place. So there's a big difference between equality and equity. Equality suggests often everybody should get the same thing. Well, that often assumes everybody started out in the same place, as opposed to equity, which is everyone should end up in the same place. What? Everybody ends up at the same place? So do I get what Matt Damon gets? Does a homeless person get what some billionaire in Wall Street gets? Is, is that the plan here? That's just a call on for full socialist communist principles in what historically has been a capitalist society that has lifted more people out of poverty than any other society in history. Then there's this. She's known as a very difficult boss. 92% of Kamala Harris's staff left her for, in her first three years as vice president. Quote, chaos reigns on the vice president's staff, wrote OTB founder Adam Adrajewski. Our auditors at Open the Books quanti quantified an extraordinarily high 91.5% staff turnover rate. Axios reporting much of Harris's staff has turned over in the last three and a half years. Of the 47 ha Harris staffers listed in 2021, only five still worked for her this spring. Evidently, it is a soul-destroying venture to work for one Kamala Harris. And then finally, there is this. She is the most liberal candidate ever, or presidential candidate ever, because she was the most liberal Senator in history, more liberal than Captain Socialist himself, Bernie Sanders. That is the Kamala Harris that she really is, not the representation that you are about to see happen every night on daily news, radio, and pop culture. I'm giving you the facts so that you can make an informed decision. Now, I wish that the church would all do this, but they don't. She is now going to be presented as a devout Christian. Um, here she is on or being discussed by CNN commentator. I forget the name of this person, but about how she called her pastor to inform her, him of being selected as the nominee of the Democratic Party. Out front Party now, Watch. Reverend Amos Brown, Kamala Harris's longtime pastor at Third Baptist Church in San Francisco. He has known the vice president for 25 years, a quarter century. Obviously, uh, you have known her through so many stages of her life and career, Reverend Brown. And you are one of the first people that Vice President Harris called yesterday from her residence. Uh, what did she say when you answered the phone? As she always said when she called me, she said, I'm calling my pastor because I want you to pray with me and pray for dog and for this nation. And I was very pleased after exchanging pleasantries with her that my wife and I joined in prayer. Yeah, and he goes on and says, we prayed for her and for Doug. So that is Kamala Harris. Now the very devout Christian who is anti-gun ownership pro-socialist communists, and wants you to be able to kill your children right up to birth. <laughs> Not all pastors, and particularly black pastors, are taking the bait. Here is a pastor in Georgia exposing her for who she really is. You know, Kamala Harris, oh, she's uh, running for the vice presidency. I call her Miss Lockup, a brother, for when she was the AG in California, a, a Negro knew, a black man knew that he was dead in the water. He was dead in the water. Matter of fact, you don't need a trial. You might well go to jail if you appear before her because she took pride in locking up black folk. And now all of a sudden she's trying to be sister girl. I'm telling it. Check out her record. She locked us up left and right. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Okay, so media powerhouses, you have your marching orders now. You have to represent her as someone who was on the side of offenders in the San Francisco community when it came to minor drug possession. So she's up for election to president of the United States. And perhaps many of you are horrified at the thought of her winning. Let me suggest something. If she wins, would it be God's judgment? Would it be God's judgment? Do you understand that the Bible repeatedly says that sometimes God judges nations by giving them certain leaders? 
Now, people on the left will say, yeah, that's why we got Donald Trump. And people on the right will say, yeah, that's why we got Joe Biden and potentially Kamala Harris and maybe uh, Barack Obama. And I understand both sides. I can see both sides. We don't have the greatest of choices. I will freely admit that. But there is clearly one who opposes the freedoms that Christians historically enjoy based on Scripture. And if she wins, it might, in fact, be God's judgment. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. My people, infants are their oppressors and women rule over them. Oh, my people, your guides mislead you and they have swallowed up the course of your paths. So the question that we might want to ask is, should you move? A lot of celebrities are saying if Donald Trump wins a second term, they're out of the country. And this from the Christian Post, citing that one in seven Americans plan to move if their preferred presidential candidate loses the election. Overall, uh, 90% of Harris supporters plan to relocate and 12% of Trump supporters plan to relocate. Now, the question has to be, what does the Bible say? Do we leave countries when we don't get our preferred leaders? Well, we can go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah oversaw the deportation of Jews from their homeland in Israel to a pagan state called Babylon that utterly destroyed their temple, their palace, killed their king, and exiled their people. And on the way into exile, as they went to live under a pagan nation with a hedonistic, uh, misogynistic, narcissistic leader named Nebuchadnezzar, Jeremiah counseled the people thus, Jeremiah 29, verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I, am, where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on his behalf for if... For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. In other words, God says, Christians, or my people, in this case Israel, you are being sent into exile at my discretion, and I want you to multiply and build up and live there and pray for its peace and its well-being, because that will be your well-being. Too many Christians freak out way too much about Uh, political wins and losses. We are God's people. We are not these world's people. We are not Republicans and Democrats. We are Christ's people. But the command here is clear. You are where you are by God's discretion and direction. Now, can we resolutely apply the principles here in Jeremiah 29 to all Christians everywhere? No. Many Christians have to flee. They have to get out. Even Jesus said, when you see these things, flee. Get out of one city and move to the next. You've got to, sometimes you've got to move, but I don't know if we're there yet. Some people cannot move. And if you did move, here's my question. What Christian utopia are you going to? There is still no other nation more committed to the freedoms that we enjoy than this one. We are far from Babylon, ancient Babylon, that is. I know it feels like we are in Babylon because of our access to 24-hour news and our personal devices that fill us with events of what's happening right now, but it's just not that bad yet. And if you stay subscribed to this channel, I will guide you through whatever happens in November, but I will do so with receipts and facts because it's important that we are informed voters and participants in American democracy. Now, I don't want to end with all bad things. Let's do some really great news to talk about, really good news, to talk about how God is still on the move. Really, really, really good. That's really good news. It's good. So yesterday, scrolling on the internet, I ran across this video testimony of a young girl who had gone to church for the first time in her life, grew up an atheist, and here was her testimony of just going to church once, watch. I'm really hesitant to post this, but I'm 21 years old, and I went to church for the first time today, and these are happy tears. I grew up in an atheist household. Um, I never was introduced to God. We never talked about Jesus, but we didn't learn about anything like that. But throughout the past few years, like I've seen signs of God in my life, and I really just wanted to let him in. And so I went to church today for the first time, and it was so beautiful. Like Everyone probably thought I looked crazy, but it was like filled with tears. I just felt so seen and loved and it was so beautiful. I can't I can't stress enough how beautiful this was. And so if you're nervous to go to church or start going to church, take me as your sign that it's literally never too late. That was literally one of the best days of my entire life. Like- Amazing. I felt seen, I felt loved. Best day in my entire life. That is what we're in the business of doing, Christians. And as much as I present politics on this show, It's not to get you riled up for politics. It's just to get you to know what you need to know about the facts of the political process. And then I went on to our latest message on our church as I watched that testimony. And I realized, 
yeah, we're doing pretty good ourselves. I pastor Waters Church with seven locations across the eastern coast. And there was this comment below our most recent message, why am I so stressed, from a Gregory Heron. I was a guest at this service, and it was one of the most meaningful and powerful experiences of my life. I struggled with demons and addiction for years that led me to losing my beautiful family and everything I worked for, worked hard for. I felt the power of Jesus deep in my soul. The message of hope and resurrection of a new life was incredible. Thank you for welcoming and being so kind to me. Amen. That's the mission of Jesus. We've got a lot more news to cover and information to give you on the extended content, but to get there, you've got to sign up for the Dependables membership plan. The $10 a month will do it. It'll get you connected to that content shortly after this ends. Also, I haven't asked this in a long time, but could you leave a review on the podcast app of your choice and let people know that this is worthy content? My book, Ending Emptiness, is out now. Check it out at endingemptiness.com. And thank you for being here, guys. When you support us financially, we support Project Rescue and the American Bible Society. That's the show. I hope you now know the things you need to know about Kamala Luther King Jr., and how to approach the offensive nature of these Olympics. Because I'm sure they've got a closing ceremony that's going to be a whopper, unless they've already adjusted it. We'll see. Anyway, I'll be there to talk about it. God bless. (laughs) 